Adventure to the Moon, first published in the London Evening Standard, 1956, collected in The Other Side of the Sky. Venture to the Moon was originally written as a series of six independent but linked stories for the London Evening Standard in 1956. When the commission was first proposed, I turned it down. It appeared impossible to write stories with only 1,500 words, which would be understandable to a mass readership, despite being set in a totally alien environment. But on second thought, this seemed such an interesting challenge that I decided to tackle it. The resulting series was successful enough to demand a second. The Starting Line The story of the first lunar expedition has been written so many times that some people will doubt if there is anything fresh to be said about it. Yet all the official reports and eyewitness accounts, the on-the-spot recordings and broadcasts, never, in my opinion, gave the full picture. They said a great deal about the discoveries that were made, but very little about the men who made them. As captain of the Endeavour, and thus commander of the British party, I was able to observe a good many things you will not find in the history books, and some, though not all, of them can now be told. One day, I hope, my opposite numbers on the Goddard and the Zielkowski will give their points of view. But as Commander Vandenberg is still on Mars and Commander Krasnin is somewhere inside the orbit of Venus, it looks as if we will have to wait a few more years for their memoirs. Confession, it is said, is good for the soul. I shall certainly feel much happier when I have told the true story behind the timing of the first lunar flight, about which there has always been a good deal of mystery. As everyone knows, the American, Russian and British ships were assembled in the orbit of Space Station 3, 500 miles above the Earth, from components flown up by relays of freight rockets. Though all the parts had been prefabricated, the assembly and testing of the ships took over two years, by which time a great many people who did not realize the complexity of the task were beginning to get slightly impatient. They had seen dozens of photos and telecasts of the three ships floating there in space beside Station 3, apparently quite complete and ready to pull away from Earth at a moment's notice. What the picture didn't show was the careful and tedious work still in progress, as thousands of pipes, wires, motors and instruments were fitted and subjected to every conceivable test. There was no definite target date for departure, since the moon is always at approximately the same distance. You can leave for it at almost any time you like, once you are ready. It makes practically no difference from the point of view of fuel consumption if you blast off at full moon or new moon, or at any time in between. We were very careful to make no predictions about blast-off, though everyone was always trying to get us to fix the time. So many things can go wrong in a spaceship, and we were not going to say goodbye to Earth until we were ready down to the last detail. I shall always remember the last commander's conference aboard the space station, when we all announced that we were ready. Since it was a cooperative venture, each party specializing in some particular task, it had been agreed that we should all make our landings within the same 24-hour period on the pre-selected site in the Mare Imbrium. The details of the journey, however, had been left to the individual commanders, presumably in the hope that we would not copy each other's mistakes. I'll be ready, said Commander Vandenberg, to make my first dummy take off at uh, 0900 tomorrow. What about you gentlemen? Shall we ask Earth Control to stand by for all three of us? That's okay by me, said Krasnin who could never be convinced that his American slang was twenty years out of date. I nodded my agreement. It was true that one bank of fuel gauges was still misbehaving, but that didn't really matter. They would be fixed by the time the tanks were filled. The dummy run consisted of an exact replica of a real blast-off, with everyone carrying out the job he would do when the time came for the genuine thing. We had practiced, of course, in mock-ups down on Earth, but this was a perfect imitation of what would happen to us when we finally took off for the moon. All that was missing was the roar of the motors that would tell us that the voyage had begun. We did six complete imitations of blast-off, took the ships to pieces to eliminate anything that hadn't behaved perfectly, then did six more. The Endeavour, the Goddard and the Zielkowski were all in the same state of serviceability. There now only remained the job of fueling up and we would be ready to leave. 
The suspense of those last few hours is not something I would care to go through again. The eyes of the world were upon us. Departure time had now been set, with an uncertainty of only a few hours. All the final tests had been made, and we were convinced that our ships were as ready as humanly possible. It was then that I had an urgent and secret personal radio call from a very high official indeed, and a suggestion was made which had so much authority behind it, there was little point in pretending that it wasn't an order. The first flight to the moon, I was reminded, was a cooperative venture. But think of the prestige if we got there first. It need only be by a couple of hours. I was shocked at the suggestion, and said so. By this time, Vandenberg and Krasnin were good friends of mine, and we were all in this together. I made every excuse I could, and said that since our flight paths had already been computed, there wasn't anything that could be done about it. Each ship was making the journey by the most economical route, to conserve fuel. If we started together, we should arrive together, within seconds. Unfortunately, someone had thought of the answer to that. Our three ships, fueled up and with their crews standing by, would be circling Earth in a state of complete readiness for several hours before they actually pulled away from their satellite orbits and headed out to the moon. At our 500-mile altitude, we took 95 minutes to make one circuit of the Earth, and only once every revolution would the moment be ripe to begin the voyage. If we could jump the gun by one revolution, the others would have to wait that 95 minutes before they could follow, and so they would land on the moon 95 minutes behind us. I won't go into the arguments, and I'm still a little ashamed that I yielded and agreed to deceive my two colleagues. We were in the shadow of Earth, in momentary eclipse, when the carefully calculated moment came. Vandenberg and Krasnin, honest fellows, thought I was going to make one more round trip with them before we all set off together. I have seldom felt a bigger heel in my life than when I pressed the firing key and felt the sudden thrust of the motors as they swept me away from my mother world. For the next ten minutes we had no time for anything but our instruments, as we checked to see that the Endeavour was forging ahead along her pre-computed orbit. Almost at the moment that we finally escaped from Earth and could cut the motors, we burst out of shadow into the full blaze of the sun. There would be no more night until we reached the moon, after five days of effortless and silent coasting through space. Already Space Station 3 and the two other ships must be a thousand miles behind. In 85 more minutes, Vandenberg and Krasnin would be back at the correct starting point and could take off after me, as we had all planned. But they could never overcome my lead, and I hoped they wouldn't be too mad at me when we met again on the moon. I switched on the rear camera and looked back at the distant gleam of the space station, just emerging from the shadow of Earth. It was some moments before I realized that the Goddard and the Zielkowski weren't still floating beside it where I'd left them. No. They were just half a mile away, neatly matching my velocity. I stared at them in utter disbelief for a second, before I realized that every one of us had had the same idea. Why, you pair of double crosses! I gasped. Then I began to laugh so much that it was several minutes before I dared call up a very worried Earth Control and tell them that everything had gone according to plan, though in no case was it the plan that had been originally announced. We were all very sheepish when we radioed each other to exchange mutual congratulations. Yet at the same time, I think everyone was secretly pleased that it had turned out this way. For the rest of the trip, we were never more than a few miles apart, and the actual landing maneuvers were so well synchronized that our three braking jets hit the moon simultaneously. Well, almost simultaneously. I might make something of the fact that the recorder tapes show I touched down two-fifths of a second ahead of Krasnin, but I better not for Vandenberg was precisely the same moment ahead of me. On a quarter of a million mile trip, I think you could call that a photo finish. Robin Hood, FRS. We had landed early in the dawn of the long lunar day, and the slanting shadows lay all around us, extending for miles across the plain. They would slowly shorten as the sun rose higher in the sky, until at noon they would almost vanish. But noon was still five days away, as we measured time on Earth, and nightfall was seven days later still. We had almost two weeks of daylight ahead of us before the sun set, and the bluely gleaming Earth became the mistress of the sky. There was little time for exploration during those first hectic days. We had to unload the ships, grow accustomed to the alien conditions surrounding us, learn to handle our electrically powered tractors and scooters, 
and erect the igloos that would serve as homes, offices and labs until the time came to leave. At a pinch, we could live in the spaceships, but it would be excessively uncomfortable and cramped. The igloos were not exactly commodious, but they were luxury after five days in space. Made of tough, flexible plastic, they were blown up like balloons and their interiors were then partitioned into separate rooms. Airlocks allowed access to the outer world and a good deal of plumbing linked to the ship's air purification plants kept the atmosphere breathable. Needless to say, the American igloo was the biggest one and had come complete with everything, including the kitchen sink, not to mention a washing machine, which we and the Russians were always borrowing. It was late in the afternoon, about 10 days after we had landed, before we were properly organized and could think about serious scientific work. The first parties made nervous little forays out into the wilderness around the base, familiarizing themselves with the territory. Of course, we already possessed minutely detailed maps and photographs of the region in which we had landed, but it was surprising how misleading they could sometimes be. What had been marked as a small hill on a chart often looked like a mountain to a man toiling along in a spacesuit, and apparently smooth plains were often covered knee-deep with dust, which made progress extremely slow and tedious. These were minor difficulties, however, and the low gravity, which gave all objects only a sixth of their terrestrial weight, compensated for much. As the scientists began to accumulate their results and specimens, the radio and TV circuits with Earth became busier and busier until they were in continuous operation. We were taking no chances. Even if we didn't get home, the knowledge we were gathering would do so. The first of the automatic supply rockets landed two days before sunset, precisely according to plan. We saw its braking jets flame briefly against the stars, then blast again a few seconds before touchdown. The actual landing was hidden from us, since for safety reasons, the dropping ground was three miles from the base. And on the moon, three miles is well over the curve of the horizon. When we got to the robot, it was standing slightly askew on its tripod shock absorbers, but in perfect condition. So was everything aboard it, from instruments to food. We carried the stores back to base in triumph, and had a celebration that was really rather overdue. The men had been working too hard and could do with some relaxation. It was quite a party. The highlight, I think, was Commander Krasnin trying to do a Cossack dance in a spacesuit. Then we turned our minds to competitive sports, but found that, for obvious reasons, outdoor activities were somewhat restricted. Games like croquet or bowls would have been practical had we had the equipment, but cricket and football were definitely out. In that gravity, even a football would go half a mile if it were given a good kick, and a cricket ball would never have been seen again. Professor Trevor Williams was the first person to think of a practical lunar sport. He was our astronomer, and also one of the youngest men ever to be made a fellow of the Royal Society, being only 30 when this ultimate accolade was conferred upon him. His work on methods of interplanetary navigation had made him world famous. Less well known, however, was his skill as a toxophilite, for two years in succession, he had been archery champion for Wales. I was not surprised, therefore, when I discovered him shooting at a target, propped up on a pile of lunar slag. The bow was a curious one, strung with steel control wire and shaped from a laminated plastic bar. I wondered where Trevor had got hold of it, then remembered that the robot freight rocket had now been cannibalized, and bits of it were appearing in all sorts of unexpected places. The arrows, however, were the really interesting feature. To give them stability on the airless moon, where of course feathers would be useless, Trevor had managed to rifle them. There was a little gadget on the bow that set them spinning like bullets when they were fired, so that they kept on course when they left the bow. Even with this rather makeshift equipment, it was possible to shoot a mile if one wished to. However, Trevor didn't want to waste arrows, which were not easy to make, he was more interested in seeing the sort of accuracy he could get. It was uncanny to watch the almost flat trajectory of the arrows. They seemed to be travelling parallel with the ground. If he wasn't careful, someone warned Trevor, his arrows might become lunar satellites and would hit him in the back when they completed their orbit. The second supply rocket arrived the next day, but this time things didn't go according to plan. It made a perfect touchdown, but unfortunately, the radar-controlled automatic pilot made one of those mistakes that such simple-minded machines delight in doing. It spotted the only really unclimbable hill in the neighborhood, 
locked its beam onto the summit of it, and settled down there like an eagle descending upon its mountain airy. Our badly needed supplies were 500 feet above our heads, and in a few hours night would be falling. What was to be done? About 15 people made the same suggestion at once, and for the next few minutes there was a great scurrying about as we rounded up all the nylon line on the base. Soon there was more than a thousand yards of it, coiled in neat loops at Trevor's feet, while we all waited expectantly. He tied one end to his arrow, drew the bow, and aimed it experimentally straight toward the stars. The arrow rose a little more than half the height of the cliff, then the weight of the line pulled it back. Sorry, said Trevor, I just can't make it. And don't forget, we'd have to send up some kind of grapnel as well if we want the end to stay up there. There was much gloom for the next few minutes as we watched the coils of line fall slowly back from the sky. The situation was really somewhat absurd. In our ships, we had enough energy to carry us a quarter of a million miles from the moon, yet we were baffled by a puny little cliff. If we had time, we could probably find a way up to the top from the other side of the hill, but that would mean travelling several miles. It would be dangerous and might well be impossible during the few hours of daylight that were left. Scientists were never baffled for long, and too many ingenious, sometimes over-ingenious, minds were working on the problem for it to remain unresolved. But this time it was a little more difficult, and only three people got the answer simultaneously. Trevor thought it over, then said non-committally, well, it's worth trying. The preparations took a little while, and we were all watching anxiously as the rays of the sinking sun crept higher and higher up the sheer cliff looming above us. Even if Trevor could get a line and grapnel up there, I thought to myself, it would not be easy making the ascent while encumbered with a spacesuit. I have no head for heights, and was glad that several mountaineering enthusiasts had already volunteered for the job. At last, everything was ready. The line had been carefully arranged so that it would lift from the ground with the minimum of hindrance. A light grapnel had been attached to the line a few feet behind the arrow. We hoped that it would catch in the rocks up there and wouldn't let us down, all too literally, when we put our trust in it. This time, however, Trevor was not using a single arrow. He attached four to the line at 200-yard intervals, and I shall never forget that incongruous spectacle of the space-suited figure gleaming in the last rays of the setting sun as it drew its bow against the sky. The arrow sped toward the stars, and before it had lifted more than 50 feet, Trevor was already fitting the second one to his improvised bow. It raced after its predecessor, carrying the other end of the long loop that was now being hoisted into space. Almost at once, the third followed, lifting its section of line, and I swear that the fourth arrow, with its section, was on the way before the first had noticeably slackened its momentum. Now that there was no question of a single arrow lifting the entire length of line, it was not hard to reach the required altitude. The first two times, the grapnel fell back. Then it caught firmly somewhere up on the hidden plateau, and the first volunteer began to haul himself up the line. It was true that he weighed only about 30 pounds in this low gravity, but it was still a long way to fall. He didn't. The stores in the freight rocket started coming down the cliff within the next hour, and everything essential had been lowered before nightfall. I must confess, however, that my satisfaction was considerably abated when one of the engineers proudly showed me the mouth organ he had had sent from Earth. Even then I felt certain that we would all be very tired of that instrument before the long lunar night had ended. But that, of course, was hardly Trevor's fault. As we walked back to the ship together, through the great pools of shadow that were flowing swiftly over the plain, he made a proposal that I'm sure has puzzled thousands of people ever since the detailed maps of the first lunar expedition were published. After all, it does seem a little odd that a flat and lifeless plain, broken by a single small mountain, should now be labelled on all the charts of the moon as Sherwood Forest. Green Fingers I am very sorry, now that it's too late, that I never got to know Vladimir Surov. As I remember him, he was a quiet little man who could understand English, but couldn't speak it well enough to make conversation. Even to his colleagues, I suspect he was a bit of an enigma. Whenever I went aboard the Zielkovsky, he would be sitting in a corner working on his notes or peering through a microscope, a man who clung to his privacy 
even in the tight and tiny world of a spaceship. The rest of the crew did not seem to mind his aloofness. When they spoke to him, it was clear that they regarded him with tolerant affection, as well as with respect. That was hardly surprising. The work he had done, developing plants and trees that could flourish far inside the Arctic Circle, had already made him the most famous botanist in Russia. The fact that the Russian expedition had taken a botanist to the moon had caused a good deal of amusement, though it was really no odder than the fact that there were biologists on both the British and American ships. During the years before the first lunar landing, a good deal of evidence had accumulated, hinting that some form of vegetation might exist on the moon, despite its airlessness and lack of water. The president of the USSR Academy of Science was one of the leading proponents of this theory, and being too old to make the trip himself had done the next best thing by sending Surov. The complete absence of any such vegetation, living or fossil, in the thousand or so square miles explored by our various parties was the first big disappointment the moon had reserved for us. Even those skeptics who were quite certain that no form of life could exist on the moon would have been very glad to have been proved wrong, as of course they were five years later when Richards and Shannon made their astonishing discovery inside the great walled plain of Eratosthenes. But that revelation still lay in the future. At the time of the first landing, it seemed that Surov had come to the moon in vain. He did not appear unduly depressed, but kept himself as busy as the rest of the crew studying soil samples and looking after the little hydroponic farm whose pressurized transparent tubes formed a gleaming network around the Zielkovsky. Neither we nor the Americans had gone in for this sort of thing, having calculated that it was better to ship food from Earth than to grow it on the spot, at least until the time came to set up a permanent base. We were right in terms of economics, but wrong in terms of morale. The tiny airtight greenhouses, inside which Surov grew his vegetables and dwarf fruit trees, were an oasis upon which we often feasted our eyes when we had grown tired of the immense desolation surrounding us. One of the many disadvantages of being commander was that I seldom had much chance to do any active exploring. I was too busy preparing reports for Earth, checking stores, arranging programs and duty rosters, conferring with my opposite numbers in the American and Russian ships, and trying, not always successfully, to guess what would go wrong next. As a result, I sometimes did not go outside the base for two or three days at a time, and it was a standing joke that my spacesuit was a haven for moths. Perhaps it is because of all this that I can remember all my trips outside so vividly. Certainly, I can recall my only encounter with Surov. It was near noon, with the sun high above the southern mountains, and the new earth a barely visible thread of silver a few degrees away from it. Henderson, our geophysicist, wanted to take some magnetic readings at a series of checkpoints a couple of miles to the east of the base. Everyone else was busy, and I was momentarily on top of my work, so we set off together on foot. The journey was not long enough to merit taking one of the scooters, especially because the charges in the batteries were getting low. In any case, I always enjoyed walking out in the open on the moon. It was not merely the scenery, which even at its most awe-inspiring one can grow accustomed to after a while. No, what I never tired of was the effortless slow-motion way in which every step took me bounding over the landscape, giving me the freedom that before the coming of space flight, men only knew in dreams. We had done the job and were halfway home when I noticed a figure moving across the plain about a mile to the south of us, not far, in fact, from the Russian base. I snapped my field glasses down inside my helmet and took a careful look at the other explorer. Even at close range, of course, you can't identify a man in a spacesuit, but because the suits are always coded by color and number, that makes no practical difference. Who is it? asked Henderson over the short-range radio channel to which we were both tuned. Blue suit, number three. That would be Surov. But I don't understand. He's by himself. It is one of the most fundamental rules of lunar exploration that no one goes anywhere alone on the surface of the moon. So many accidents can happen, which would be trivial if you were with a companion, but fatal if you were by yourself. How would you manage, for example, if your spacesuit developed a slow leak in the small of the back and you couldn't put on a repair patch? That may sound funny, but it's happened. Oh, perhaps his buddy has had an accident and he's going to fetch help, suggested Henderson. 
Maybe you'd better call him. I shook my head. Surov was obviously in no hurry. He had been out on a trip of his own and was making his leisurely way back to the Zielkovsky. It was no concern of mine if Commander Krasnin let his people go out on solo trips, though it seemed a deplorable practice. And if Surov was breaking regulations, it was equally no concern of mine to report him. During the next two months, the men often spotted Surov making his lone way over the landscape, but he always avoided them if they got too near. I made some discreet inquiries and found that Commander Krasnin had been forced, owing to shortage of men, to relax some of his safety rules. But I couldn't find out what Surov was up to, though I never dreamed that his commander was equally in the dark. It was with an I told you so feeling that I got Krasnin's emergency call. We had all had men in trouble before and had had to send out help, but this was the first time anyone had been lost and had not replied when his ship had sent out the recall signal. There was a hasty radio conference. A line of action was drawn up and search parties fanned out from each of the three ships. Once again, I was with Henderson and it was only common sense for us to backtrack along the route that we had seen Surov following. It was in what we regarded as our territory, quite some distance away from Surov's own ship, and as we scrambled up the low foothills, it occurred to me for the first time that the Russian might have been doing something he wanted to keep from his colleagues. What it might be, I could not imagine. Henderson found him and yelled for help over his suit radio, but it was much too late. Surov was lying face down, his deflated suit crumpled around him. He had been kneeling when something had smashed the plastic globe of his helmet. You could see how he had pitched forward and died instantaneously. When Commander Krasnin reached us, we were still staring at the unbelievable object that Surov had been examining when he died. It was about three feet high, a leathery, greenish oval rooted to the rocks with a widespread network of tendrils. Yes, rooted, for it was a plant. A few yards away were two others, much smaller and apparently dead, since they were blackened and withered. My first reaction was, so there is life on the moon after all. It was not until Krasnin's voice spoke in my ears that I realized how much more marvelous was the truth. Poor Vladimir, he said. We knew he was a genius, yet we laughed at him when he told us of his dream. So he kept his greatest work a secret. He conquered the Arctic with his hybrid wheat, but that was only a beginning. He has brought life to the moon, and death as well. As I stood there, in that first moment of astonished revelation, it still seemed a miracle. Today all the world knows the history of Surov's cactus, as it was inevitably, if quite inaccurately, christened, and it has lost much of its wonder. His notes have told the full story and have described the years of experimentation that finally led him to a plant whose leathery skin would enable it to survive in vacuum and whose far-ranging, acid-secreting roots would enable it to grow upon rocks where even lichens would be hard put to thrive. And we have seen the realization of the second stage of Surov's dream, for the cactus which will forever bear his name, has already broken up vast areas of the lunar rock and so prepared a way for the more specialized plants that now feed every human being upon the moon. Krasnin bent down beside the body of his colleague and lifted it effortlessly against the low gravity. He fingered the shattered fragments of the plastic helmet and shook his head in perplexity. What could have happened to him, he said. It almost looks as if the plant did it, but that's ridiculous. The great enigma stood there on the no longer barren plain, tantalizing us with its promise and its mystery. Then Henderson said slowly, as if thinking aloud, I believe I've got the answer. I've just remembered some of the botany I did at school. If Surov designed this plant for lunar conditions, how would he arrange for it to propagate itself? The seeds would have to be scattered over a very wide area in the hope of finding a few suitable places to grow. There are no birds or animals here to carry them in the way that happens on Earth. I can only think of one solution, and some of our terrestrial plants have already used it. He was interrupted by my yell. Something had hit with a resounding clang against the metal waistband of my suit. It did no damage, 
but it was so sudden and unexpected that it took me utterly by surprise. A seed lay at my feet, about the size and shape of a plum stone. A few yards away, we found the one that had shattered Surov's helmet as he bent down. He must have known that the plant was ripe, but in his eagerness to examine it, had forgotten what that implied. I have seen a cactus throw its seed a quarter of a mile under the low lunar gravity. Surov had been shot at point-blank range by his own creation. All that glitters. This is really Commander Vandenberg's story, but he's too many million miles away to tell it. It concerns his geophysicist, Dr. Paintner, who is generally believed to have gone to the moon to get away from his wife. At one time or other, we were all supposed, often by our wives, to have done just that. However, in Paintner's case, there was just enough truth to make it stick. It was not that he disliked his wife. One could almost say the contrary. He would do anything for her, but unfortunately the things that she wanted him to do cost rather too much. She was a lady of extravagant tastes, and such ladies are advised not to marry scientists, even scientists who go to the moon. Mrs. Paintner's weakness was for jewellery, particularly diamonds. As might be expected, this was a weakness that caused her husband a good deal of worry. Being a conscientious as well as an affectionate husband, he did not merely worry about it, he did something about it. He became one of the world's leading experts on diamonds, from the scientific rather than the commercial point of view, and probably knew more about their composition, origin and properties than any other man alive. Unfortunately, you may know a lot about diamonds without ever possessing any, and her husband's erudition was not something that Mrs. Paintner could wear around her neck when she went to a party. Geophysics, as I have mentioned, was Dr. Paintner's real business. Diamonds were merely a sideline. He had developed many remarkable surveying instruments which could probe the interior of the Earth by means of electric impulses and magnetic waves, so giving a kind of X-ray picture of the hidden strata far below. It was hardly surprising, therefore, that he was one of the men chosen to pry into the mysterious interior of the moon. He was quite eager to go, but it seemed to Commander Vandenberg that he was reluctant to leave Earth at this particular moment. A number of men had shown such symptoms. Sometimes they were due to fears that could not be eradicated, and an otherwise promising man had to be left behind. In Paintner's case, however, the reluctance was quite impersonal. He was in the middle of a big experiment, something he had been working on all his life, and he didn't want to leave Earth until it was finished. However, the first lunar expedition could not wait for him, so he had to leave his project in the hands of his assistants. He was continually exchanging cryptic radio messages with them to the great annoyance of the signals section of Space Station 3. In the wonder of a new world waiting to be explored, Paintner soon forgot his earthly preoccupations. He would dash hither and yon over the lunar landscape on one of the neat little electric scooters the Americans had brought with them, carrying seismographs, magnetometers, gravity meters, and all the other esoteric tools of the geophysicist's trade. He was trying to learn in a few weeks what it had taken men hundreds of years to discover about their own planet. It was true that he only had a small sample of the moon's 14 million square miles of territory to explore, but he intended to make a thorough job of it. From time to time, he continued to get messages from his colleagues back on Earth, as well as brief but affectionate signals from Mrs. P. Neither seemed to interest him very much, even when you are not so busy that you hardly have time to sleep, a quarter of a million miles puts most of your personal affairs in a different perspective. I think that on the moon, Dr. Paintner was really happy for the first time in his life. If so, he was not the only one. Not far from our base, there was a rather fine crater pit, a great blowhole in the lunar surface, almost two miles from rim to rim. Though it was fairly close at hand, it was outside the normal area of our joint operations, and we had been on the moon for six weeks before Paintner led a party of three men off in one of the baby tractors to have a look at it. They disappeared from radio range over the edge of the moon, but we weren't worried about that, because if they ran into trouble, they could always call Earth and get any message relayed back to us. Paintner and his men were gone 48 hours, which is about the maximum for continuous working on the moon, even with booster drugs.
At first their little expedition was quite uneventful, and therefore quite unexciting. Everything went according to plan. They reached the crater, inflated their pressurised igloo and unpacked their stores, took their instrument readings and then set up a portable drill to get core samples. It was while he was waiting for the drill to bring him up a nice section of the moon that Paintner made his second great discovery. He had made his first about ten hours before, but he didn't know it yet. Around the lip of the crater, lying where they had been thrown up by the great explosions that had convulsed the lunar landscape 300 million years before, were immense piles of rock, which must have come from many miles down in the moon's interior. Anything he could do with his little drill, thought Paintner, could hardly compare with this. Unfortunately, the mountain-sized geological specimens that lay all around him were not neatly arranged in their correct order. They had been scattered over the landscape, much further than the eye could see, according to the arbitrary violence of the eruptions that had blasted them into space. Paintner climbed over these immense slag heaps, taking a swing at likely samples with his little hammer. Presently, his colleagues heard him yell and saw him come running back to them, carrying what appeared to be a lump of rather poor quality glass. It was some time before he was sufficiently coherent to explain what all the fuss was about, and some time later still, before the expedition remembered its real job and got back to work. Vandenberg watched the returning party as it headed back to the ship. The four men didn't seem as tired as one would have expected, considering the fact that they had been on their feet for two days. Indeed, there was a certain jauntiness about their movements, which even the spacesuits couldn't wholly conceal. You could see that the expedition had been a success. In that case, Paintner would have two causes for congratulations. The priority message that had just come back from Earth was very cryptic, but it was clear that Paintner's work there, whatever it was, had finally reached a triumphant conclusion. Commander Vandenberg almost forgot the message when he saw what Paintner was holding in his hand. He knew what a raw diamond looked like, and this was the second largest that anyone had ever seen. Only the Cullinan, tipping the scales at 3,026 carats, beat it by a slender margin. We, we ought to have expected it, he heard Paintner babble happily. Diamonds are always found associated with volcanic vents, but somehow... I never thought the analogy would hold here. Vandenberg suddenly remembered the signal and handed it over to Paintner. He read it quickly, and his jaw dropped. Never in his life, Vandenberg told me, had he seen a man so instantly deflated by a message of congratulation. The signal read, We've done it. Test 541 with modified pressure container. Complete success. No practical limit to size. Costs negligible. What's the matter? said Vandenberg when he saw the stricken look on Paintner's face. It doesn't seem bad news to me, whatever it means. Paintner gulped two or three times, like a stranded fish, then stared helplessly at the great crystal that almost filled the palm of his hand. He tossed it into the air, and it floated back in that slow-motion way everything has under lunar gravity. Finally, he found his voice. My lab's been working for years he said, trying to synthesize diamonds. Yesterday this thing was worth a million dollars. Today it's worth a couple of hundred. I'm not sure I'll bother to carry it back to Earth. Well, he did carry it back. It seemed a pity not to. For about three months, Mrs. P had the finest diamond necklace in the world, worth every bit of a thousand dollars, mostly the cost of cutting and polishing. Then the Paintner process went into commercial production, and a month later, she got her divorce. The grounds were extreme mental cruelty, and I suppose you could say it was justified. Watch this space. It was quite a surprise to discover, when I looked it up, that the most famous experiment we carried out while we were on the moon had its beginnings way back in 1955. At that time, high-altitude rocket research had been going for only about 10 years, mostly at White Sands, New Mexico. 1955 was the date of one of the most spectacular of those early experiments, one that involved the ejection of sodium into the upper atmosphere. On Earth, even on the clearest night, the sky between the stars isn't completely dark. 
there's a very faint background glow, and part of it is caused by the fluorescence of sodium atoms a hundred miles up. Since it would take the sodium in a good many cubic miles of the upper atmosphere to fill a single matchbox, it seemed to the early investigators that they could make quite a fireworks display if they used a rocket to dump a few pounds of the stuff into the ionosphere. They were right. The sodium squirted out of a rocket above White Sands early in 1955, producing a great yellow glow in the sky, which was visible like a kind of artificial moonlight for over an hour before the atoms dispersed. This experiment wasn't done for fun, though it was fun, but for a serious scientific purpose. Instruments trained on this glow were able to gather new knowledge about the upper air, knowledge that went into the stockpile of information without which spaceflight would never have been possible. When they got to the moon, the Americans decided that it would be a good idea to repeat the experiment there on a much larger scale. A few hundred kilograms of sodium fired up from the surface would produce a display that would be visible from Earth with a good pair of field glasses as it fluoresced its way up through the lunar atmosphere. Some people, by the way, still don't realize that the moon has an atmosphere it's about a million times too thin to be breathable, but if you have the right instruments, you can detect it. As a meteor shield, it's first rate, for though it may be tenuous, it's hundreds of miles deep. Everyone had been talking about the experiment for days. The sodium bomb had arrived from Earth in the last supply rocket, and a very impressive piece of equipment it looked. Its operation was extremely simple. When ignited, an incendiary charge vaporized the sodium until a high pressure was built up. Then the diaphragm burst, and the stuff was squirted up into the sky through a specially shaped nozzle. It would be shot off soon after nightfall, and when the cloud of sodium rose out of the moon's shadow into direct sunlight, it would start to glow with tremendous brilliance. Nightfall on the moon is one of the most awe-inspiring sights in the whole of nature, made doubly so because as you watch the sun's flaming disk creep so slowly below the mountains, you know that it will be 14 days before you see it again. But it does not bring darkness, at least not on this side of the moon. There is always the earth hanging motionless in the sky, the one heavenly body that neither rises nor sets. The light pouring back from her clouds and seas floods the lunar landscape with a soft blue-green radiance, so that it is often easier to find your way around at night than under the fierce glare of the sun. Even those who were not supposed to be on duty had come out to watch the experiment. The sodium bomb had been placed at the middle of the big triangle formed by the three ships and stood upright with its nozzle pointing at the stars. Dr. Anderson, the astronomer of the American team, was testing the firing circuits, but everyone else was at a respectful distance. The bomb looked perfectly capable of living up to its name, though it was really about as dangerous as a soda water siphon. All the optical equipment of the three expeditions seemed to have been gathered together to record the performance. Telescopes, spectroscopes, motion picture cameras, and everything else one could think of were lined up, ready for action. And this, I knew, was nothing compared with the battery that must be zeroed on us from Earth. Every amateur astronomer who could see the moon tonight would be standing by in his back garden, listening to the radio commentary that told him of the progress of the experiment. I glanced up at the gleaming planet that dominated the sky above me. The land areas seemed to be fairly free from cloud, so the folks at home should have a good view. That seemed only fair, after all, they were footing the bill. There were still 15 minutes to go. Not for the first time I wished there was a reliable way of smoking a cigarette inside a spacesuit without getting the helmet so badly fogged that you couldn't see. Our scientists had solved so many much more difficult problems, it seemed a pity that they couldn't do something about that one. To pass the time, for this was an experiment where I had nothing to do, I switched on my suit radio and listened to Dave Bolton, who was making a very good job on the commentary. Dave was our chief navigator and a brilliant mathematician. He also had a glib tongue and a picturesque turn of speech, and sometimes his recordings had to be censored by the BBC. There was nothing they could do about this one, however, for it was going out live from the relay stations on Earth. Dave had finished a brief and lucid explanation of the purpose of the experiment, 
describing how the cloud of glowing sodium would enable us to analyze the lunar atmosphere as it rose through it at approximately a thousand miles an hour. However, he went on to tell the waiting millions on Earth, let's make one point clear. Even when the bomb has gone off, you won't see a darn thing for ten minutes, and neither will we. The sodium cloud will be completely invisible while it's rising up through the darkness of the moon's shadows. Then, quite suddenly, it will flash into brilliance as it enters the sun's rays, which are streaming past over our heads right now as we stare up into space. No one is quite sure how bright it will be, but it's a pretty safe guess that you'll be able to see it in any telescope bigger than a two-inch. So it should just be within range of a good pair of binoculars. He had to keep this sort of thing up for another ten minutes, and it was a marvel to me how he managed to do it. Then the great moment came, and Anderson closed the firing circuit. The bomb started to cook, building up pressure inside as the sodium volatilized. After thirty seconds, there was a sudden puff of smoke from the long, slender nozzle pointing up at the sky, and then we had to wait for another ten minutes while the invisible cloud rose to the stars. After all this build-up, I told myself, the result had better be good. The seconds and minutes ebbed away. Then a sudden yellow glow began to spread across the sky, like a vast and unwavering aurora that became brighter even as we watched. It was as if an artist was sprawling strokes across the stars with a flame-filled brush. And as I stared at those strokes, I suddenly realized that someone had brought off the greatest advertising coup in history. For the strokes formed letters, and the letters formed two words. The name of a certain soft drink, too well known to need any further publicity from me. How had it been done? The first answer was obvious. Someone had placed a suitably cut stencil in the nozzle of the sodium bomb, so that the stream of escaping vapour had shaped itself to the words. Since there was nothing to distort it, the pattern had kept its shape during its invisible ascent to the stars. I had seen skywriting on Earth, but this was something on a far larger scale. Whatever I thought of them, I couldn't help admiring the ingenuity of the men who had perpetrated the scheme. The O's and A's had given them a bit of trouble, but the C's and L's were perfect. After the initial shock, I am glad to say that the scientific program proceeded as planned. I wish I could remember how Dave Bolton rose to the occasion in his commentary. It must have been a strain even for his quick wits. By this time, of course, half the Earth could see what he was describing. The next morning, every newspaper on the planet carried that famous photo of the crescent moon with the luminous slogan painted across its darkened sector. The letters were visible before they finally dispersed into space for over an hour. By that time, the words were almost a thousand miles long and were beginning to get blurred, but they were still readable until they last faded from sight in the ultimate vacuum between the planets. Then the real fireworks began. Commander Vandenberg was absolutely furious and promptly started to grill all his men. However, it was soon clear that the saboteur, if you could call him that, had been back on Earth. The bomb had been prepared there and shipped ready for its immediate use. It did not take long to find and fire the engineer who had carried out the substitution. He couldn't have cared less, since his financial needs had been taken care of for a good many years to come. As for the experiment itself, it was completely successful from the scientific point of view. All the recording instruments worked perfectly as they analyzed the light from the unexpectedly shaped cloud. But we never let the Americans live it down, and I'm afraid poor Captain Vandenberg was the one who suffered most. Before he came to the moon, he was a confirmed teetotaler, and much of his refreshment came from a certain wasp-wasted bottle. But now, as a matter of principle, he can only drink beer, and he hates the stuff. A Question of Residence I have already described the, shall we say, jockeying for position before takeoff on the first flight to the moon. As it turned out, the American, Russian and British ships landed just about simultaneously. No one has ever explained, however, why the British ship came back nearly two weeks after the others. Oh, I know the official story. I ought to, for I helped to concoct it. It is true as far as it goes, but it scarcely goes far enough. On all counts, the joint expedition had been a triumphant success. 
There had only been one casualty, and in the manner of his death, Vladimir Surov had made himself immortal. We had gathered knowledge that would keep the scientists of Earth busy for generations, and that would revolutionize almost all our ideas concerning the nature of the universe around us. Yes, our five months on the moon had been well spent, and we could go home to such welcomes as few heroes had ever had before. However, there was still a good deal of tidying up to be done. The instruments that had been scattered all over the lunar landscape were still busily recording, and much of the information they gathered could not be automatically radioed back to Earth. There was no point in all three of the expeditions staying on the moon to the last minute. The personnel of one would be sufficient to finish the job. But who would volunteer to be caretaker while the others went back to gain the glory? It was a difficult problem, but one that would have to be solved very soon. As far as supplies were concerned, we had little to worry about. The automatic freight rockets could keep us provided with air, food and water for as long as we wished to stay on the moon. We were all in good health, though a little tired. None of the anticipated psychological troubles had cropped up, perhaps because we had all been so busy on tasks of absorbing interest that we'd had no time to worry about going crazy. But of course we all looked forward to getting back to Earth and seeing our families again. The first change of plan was forced upon us by the Zielkowski being put out of commission when the ground beneath one of her landing legs suddenly gave way. The ship managed to stay upright, but the hull was badly twisted, and the pressure cabin sprang dozens of leaks. There was much debate about on-the-spot repairs, but it was decided that it would be far too risky for her to take off in this condition. The Russians had no alternative but to thumb lifts back in the Goddard and the Endeavour by using the Zielkowski's unwanted fuel, our ships would be able to manage the extra load. However, the return flight would be extremely cramped and uncomfortable for all concerned because everyone would have to eat and sleep in shifts. Either the American or the British ship, therefore, would be the first back to Earth. During those final weeks, as the work of the expedition was brought to its close, relations between Commander Vandenberg and myself were somewhat strained. I even wondered if we ought to settle the matter by tossing for it. Another problem was also engaging my attention, that of crew discipline. Perhaps this is too strong a phrase. I would not like it to be thought that a mutiny ever seemed probable, but all my men were now a little abstracted and liable to be found, if off duty, scribbling furiously in corners. I knew exactly what was going on, for I was involved in it myself. There wasn't a human being on the moon who had not sold exclusive rights to some newspaper or magazine, and we were all haunted by approaching deadlines. The radio teletype to Earth was in continuous operation, sending tens of thousands of words a day, while ever larger slabs of deathless prose were being dictated over the speech circuits. It was Professor Williams, our very practical-minded astronomer, who came to me one day with the answer to my main problem. Skipper, he said, balancing himself precariously on the all-too-collapsible table I use as my working desk inside the igloo. There's no technical reason, is there, why we should get back to Earth first? No, I said. Merely a matter of fame, fortune, and seeing our families again? But I admit those aren't technical reasons. We could stay here another year if Earth kept sending supplies. If you want to suggest that, however, I shall take great pleasure in strangling you. It's not as bad as that. But once the main body has gone back, whichever party's left can follow in two or three weeks at the latest. He'll get a lot of credit, in fact, for self-sacrifice, modesty, and similar virtues. Which will be very poor compensation for being second home. Right. We need something else to make it worthwhile. Some more material reward. Agreed. What do you suggest? Williams pointed to the calendar hanging on the wall in front of me, between the two pin-ups we had stolen from the Goddard. The length of our stay was indicated by the days that had been crossed off in red ink. A big question mark in two weeks' time showed when the first ship would be heading back to Earth. There's your answer, he said. If we go back then, do you realize what'll happen? I'll tell you. He did, and I kicked myself for not having thought of it first. The next day, I explained my decision to Vandenberg and Krasnin. We'll stay behind and do the mopping up, I said. It's a matter of common sense. The Goddard's a much bigger ship than ours and can carry an extra four people, while we can only manage two more. And even then it'll be a squeeze. 
If you go first, Van, it'll save a lot of people from eating their hearts out here for longer than necessary. Well, that's very big of you, replied Vandenberg. I won't hide the fact that we'll be happy to get home, and it's logical, I admit, now that the Zielkowski's out of action. Still, it means quite a sacrifice on your part, and I really don't like to take advantage of it. I gave an expansive wave. Think nothing of it, I answered. As long as you boys don't grab all the credit, we'll take our turn. After all, we'll have the show here to ourselves when you've gone back to Earth. Krasnin was looking at me with a rather calculating expression, and I found it singularly difficult to return his gaze. I hate to sound cynical, he said, but I've learned to be a little suspicious when people start doing big favors without very good reasons. And frankly, I don't think the reason you've given is good enough. You wouldn't have anything else up your sleeve, would you? Oh, very well, I sighed. I hope to get a little credit, but I see it's no use trying to convince anyone of the purity of my motives. I've got a reason, and you might as well know it, but please don't spread it around. I'd hate the folks back on Earth to be disillusioned. They still think of us as noble and heroic seekers after knowledge. Let's keep it that way, for all our sakes. Then I pulled out the calendar and explained to Vandenberg and Krasnin what Williams had already explained to me. They listened with scepticism, then with growing sympathy. I had no idea it was that bad, said Vandenberg at last. Americans never have, I said sadly. Anyway, that's the way it's been for half a century, and it doesn't seem to get any better. So you agree with my suggestion? Well, of course. Suits us fine, anyhow. Until the next expedition's ready, the moon's all yours. I remembered that phrase two weeks later, as I watched the Goddard blast up into the sky toward the distant, beckoning Earth. It was lonely then, when the Americans and all but two of the Russians had gone. We envied them the reception they got, and watched jealously on the TV screens their triumphant processions through Moscow and New York. Then we went back to work and bided our time. Whenever we felt depressed, we would do little sums on bits of paper and would be instantly restored to cheerfulness. The Red Crosses marched across the calendar as the short terrestrial days went by, days that seemed to have very little connection with a slow cycle of lunar time. At last, we were ready. All the instrument readings were taken, all the specimens and samples safely packed away aboard the ship. The motors roared into life, giving us for a moment the weight we would feel again when we were back in Earth's gravity. Below us, the rugged lunar landscape, which we had grown to know so well, fell swiftly away. Within seconds, we could see no sign at all of the buildings and instruments we had so laboriously erected and which future explorers would one day use. The homeward voyage had begun. We returned to Earth in uneventful discomfort, joined the already half-dismantled Goddard beside Space Station 3, and were quickly ferried down to the world we had left seven months before. Seven months. That, as Williams had pointed out, was the all-important figure. We had been on the moon for more than half a financial year, and for all of us, it had been the most profitable year of our lives. Sooner or later, I suppose, this interplanetary loophole will be plugged. The Department of Inland Revenue is still fighting a gallant rearguard action, but we seem neatly covered under Section 57, Paragraph 8 of the Capital Gains Act of 1972. We wrote our books and articles on the moon, and until there's a lunar government to impose income tax, we're hanging on to every penny. And if the ruling finally goes against us, there's always Mars. <laughs>